I'm Tom Williams with Acacia Communications, which is now part of Cisco. <clears throat> um, I'd like to talk today about uh, next steps in coherent standardization and uh, really focus on some industry trends and how we think about coherent standardization and its impact on all coherent development going forward. Uh, I'd like to start by looking at a few trends in the uh, in the coherent market. Uh, the first of these is simply that coherent as we move to higher data rates, coherent is uh, being adopted in shorter reach interfaces. For example, uh, you know, 400 CR targeted 80 to 120 kilometer reaches at 800 gig. OIF is now uh, working on a project to define an 800 LR that will target 10 kilometers and below. You know, ultimately, in a few generations, you can imagine coherent may be inside the data center as well. Um, these shorter reach interfaces tend to be higher volume than traditional transport applications. Um, and as we move to these shorter reach interfaces, uh, it becomes more important to have uh, interoperability and pluggable form factors, uh, particularly pluggable form factors that can plug directly into router interfaces in the same form factor as client interfaces. Uh, when we look at uh, you know the, this trend towards standardization, uh, you know 400 gig was a big step forward in in this process, and we have uh, a variety of different standardized interfaces: ZR, ZR Plus, Open Rotom. And um, you know when you look at the forecast for these solutions, they are uh, growing. Uh, you know this is Lake County data that shows 84% CAGR on a port basis over the next five years or so. And these standardized interfaces are displacing both higher performing uh, solutions uh, in, in more traditional transport applications, as well as direct attack solutions in some of the shorter reach interfaces. So really uh, growing in both directions. And if you think about it over time, these standardized pluggable interfaces uh, will be uh, contributing a larger and larger portion of all of the coherent uh, ports in the industry. The third trend <laughs> has to do with the uh, our, our Shannon limit that has been talked about quite a bit over the last few years. Uh, you know, we're getting to a point where uh, there are still incremental improvements that are, are being made, but uh, whereas before you you were both scaling in terms of the amount of uh, data that was transmitted over a single set of optics, as well as increasing the capacity on the fiber. Uh, we're still scaling as we increase baud rate, we're scaling the uh, amount of data uh, per, per set of optics, but the amount of data on a fiber uh, is growing more incrementally than, uh, than what it did in previous generations. And so this changes the way that we think uh, about, you know, uh, how how we develop develop products and, and different uh, different cycles and and how we need to find uh, find ways to to grow network bandwidth more efficiently over time. And I think if you consider all of these things, basically, these the high volume standardized solutions are going to uh, really be what drives the industry investment. And so I think that we we view that as being sort of the starting point where where the largest volume is going to be and then you want everything else to sort of build on top of that investment um i'd like to take a little time to go through sort of disaggregation and standardization which are you know two related but different ideas but they they tend to have the most benefit when they're combined uh, the the idea of open networks that allow for more flexibility and, and more vendor diversity uh, i want to look at this from a network operator perspective and a vendor perspective and what are the trade-offs for both uh, on the network operator side um, the, you know the the opportunity is the the ability to uh, accelerate adoption of new technology so you don't have to wait until you know a single vendor has all of the the different pieces you can upgrade your transmission without upgrading your line system or vice versa um, so you can make more flexible decisions about when to upgrade to new technology <clears throat> um, and, and individual parts of the network and you can also uh, obviously in a multi-vendor environment you can mitigate supply risk because if one vendor falls down you have other vendors to rely on uh, and and you can create a more competitive vendor landscape um, but this doesn't come for free on the network operator side you do need to invest more resources both in terms of aligning the vendor base to these interoperable standards um, and doing more qualifications if you 
uh, want to bring on more vendors, if you want to create a more competitive environment, then you need to spend resources on additional qualifications. Uh, there's also a trade-off in terms of uh, performance that is getting small, but there still is some trade-off between uh, what can be achieved in a multi-vendor interop environment compared to a bookended proprietary uh, solution. So, you know, these are factors to, to consider. On the vendor side, why do vendors support uh, standardization and interop? Partly it's because their their customers want them to. Certainly that uh, that always plays into the equation, but there there is a real value for vendors in terms of de-risking development. Um, by by having the industry get together and kind of decide where where the next investment node is going to be and where the, the industry solutions are going to be, uh, it it makes it allows investment with a higher level of confidence to know that you're you know you're going to have an ROI on, on that investment. You do have increased levels of competition, but you you know that there's going to be a market there that you have a fair shot at. Um, it does also provide an opportunity to improve development efficiency, and and we'll talk about that in in a little bit. On the on the downside, I think the uh, the obvious factor here is that it's more challenging for the vendors to differentiate. Um, you have more competition potentially, and uh, you might be able to differentiate in terms of time to market or maybe some power benefit, but performance is kind of normalized, and so uh, it, it's a bit more challenging as a vendor to be able to differentiate. Um, when you look at all of these things, I think the the trend in the industry is clearly <clears throat> moving toward more more standardization, more open open networks. Um, I don't see this this going back in the other direction. Um, next, I'd like to consider when we look at next generation standards or what we've done in the past. A couple of couple of aspects that really stand out in terms of how how we think about things and why we end up with certain decisions. Um, you know, in 400 gig, we uh, we ended up most of these standards for 400 gig were based on 16 qualm modulation, and the reason for that is pretty straightforward. 16 qualm really gives you a sweet spot in terms of performance that allows you to address a pretty wide range of network applications. Um, it allows you to then dial down if you have you know for your highest most challenging links you're able to dial down and kind of have a half rate solution so for 400 gig 16 qualm you can go down to 200 gig upsk if you need to address the the most challenging links in in the network um it also has the benefit of being well aligned with pam4 technology that's being used for a lot of high volume applications inside the data center so you know where you have uh, development investment, and not obviously different module solutions, but there there's efficiency in having correlation between these solutions, and and you can leverage some of the component technology and the component investment, uh, and and bridge across the different applications. So that that really does provide some some benefit because you're operating at the same pod rate with similar types of uh, of modulation and things like drivers. Um, on the uh, and the other aspect is as we scale the data rate, um, you know, if you think if we're going to be focused on 16 qualm modulation, if we want to double the data rate, then the straightforward way to do that is to double the baud rate um, by continue by keeping the same modulation format. We're we're in the same ballpark in terms of uh, applications that we can address with each generation it becomes a bit more challenging. So you need a few a few enhancements each time, but it's sort of a framework that allows you to to kind of scale the network, double the double the capacity, and and kind of keep the the same kind of applications. Um, the other thing is just in terms of timing. You know, I think it's healthy for the industry to have sort of these big investment phases that are, you know, three, four, five years uh, apart, um, because it allows allows the vendors to have a, a significant ROI. It fits with network operator upgrade cycles. Um, and it avoids lots of small iterative steps in between. Um, so we, we think all of that is, uh, is, is a healthy approach to, to how the industry can evolve. And if you look at how the industry has evolved uh, to date, we had what we refer to as class one um, you know, products. And there was multiple product uh, generations and product types within class one. But class one was operating in the 30 to 34 gigabaud range, uh, providing 
100 gig QPSK, 200 gig 16 qualm. Um, you know, if you start on the left, the AC100 or the OIF 5x7 was just a 100 gig product. Um, you know, then the CFP was just a 100 gig product. Then we introduced 200 gig products. Uh, standardization in this time frame was really about form factors. Think CFP2 ACO, CFP2 DCO, um, or component level where OIF standardized things like coherent receivers. Um, not so much. There was some optical standards. There's 100 gig optical standards, but uh, generally left a lot of performance on the table compared to proprietary implementations, so not widely deployed. When we move to the current generation operating in 60 to 68 gigabaud, um, now we did move to optical interface standards. So in this case, we had, might have had Ma, uh, module form factors in mind, but generally had, uh, you know, interoperable optical uh, interfaces, uh, ZR, ZR plus, uh, open rotum. And, and this has created a, a higher level of openness in, uh, in networks. And in this case, we're, as I mentioned before, 400 gig 16 quantum, 200 gig QPSK. So we scale everything by a factor of two. Looking toward the next generation, you know, we see a class three component that operates in the 120 to 136 gigabaud range that will support 800 gig 16 qualm, 400 gig QPSK, um, will allow you to cover a wide range of, of applications, fits that model of the development timeline being on the, on the right pace and cadence. And that's what we're seeing in the industry standards discussions that have started. We're still fairly early in the process. Some are more mature than others, but um, you know, I think 800 ZRLR and, and open Rotom discussions are, are kind of getting started for this next generation. And I think we'll, we'll end up with something like this where we'll be operating in that baud rate and uh, in the 16 qualm uh, for the higher, higher data rate applications. So I want to summarize with a few, uh, just a few thoughts on, you know, what are the, what do we want to be thinking about as we go to, uh, to next generation? Obviously standardization is going to become more and more important, right? This trend is only going forward. Uh, the shorter reach interfaces are going to drive the, the biggest investment. And so we, we really need to think about how we develop solutions that can scale to, to high volume and, and in, a, in a power efficient and cost effective way. Um, I think you'll still have proprietary solutions that target the highest levels of performance, multi-hall functionality, high, you know, really making the, the trade-offs to optimize for performance. Uh, and, 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 you know, maybe being a little bit more relaxed on the, the power requirements. And these are going to target your, your fiber constrained long haul applications, your submarine applications, um, really where, where it's really worth taking that extra step to optimize the performance and, and get the most efficient transmission. But over time, these, these may still, you know, the absolute number of these solution, these ports may actually continue to grow, but the, uh, share of overall coherent ports will will probably decrease over time. And then finally, I think the you know you can't overlook the importance of uh, optoelectronic integration. I think if everything will be as we're as we're approaching the Shannon limit. We've got to develop solutions that are cost effective. As we move to higher baud rate, we need the better performance of improved signal integrity. And and so your your challenges are less about the bandwidth capabilities of the optical material, but the ability to get the data from one component to the next and the, the electric, electrical interfaces. And I think all of that speaks to the need for uh, high levels of optoelectronic integration. So that is my uh, final uh, slide. I appreciate the time to, uh, to speak to everyone, and I really hope that we can all uh, be in person for, uh, for hopefully LFC next year and, and get back to normal soon. Thanks, everyone.